uh, they, they might be consuming fruit and, and honey, and I get them to, to go off it and visceral fat will go away. Well, war- good morning. Welcome. Thanks for, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's good to see yeah. you again. So I a bit of a stressor taking care of a, a chest painter, but, uh, I, I, I got through it. So oh, I'm my here. Goodness. I yeah, that's didn't a good- realize I have that clinical issue right to, to the end there. So that's a, that's a fun, fun way to start to start the morning. Somebody having chest pain, goodness. Um, well, you know, <laughs> they you, were are, carnivore. Yeah. Well, of course not. No. Are you, are you, uh, are you, you okay to go then and everything is, you know, you're, I am. Yeah, I'm good. I'm free for the next three hours. So okay. well, I don't, I don't know that I have three hours, but uh, we've got, yeah. uh, so let me, um, start by saying, you know, appreciate what you've been doing. You've been continuing to advocate for, uh, diet and lifestyle, which I think more, more of us as physicians just have to do and need to do. I mean, we, you know, we have a healthcare system that is just not serving its purpose in my view, particularly when it comes to chronic disease. You've been a champion of, uh, I guess, uh, the argument that visceral fat is, is a problem is, is it may be one of the more significant problems. Um, do you care? How did you derive that? I mean, what, what was it? What was a calculus that said, Hey, we got to really look after vis- visceral fat is, is, you know, a big yeah. issue. <clears throat> yeah. So great question. So it really came down to, uh, I'd, I'd like to say I figured it out on my own, but I've got to give credit to my uh, research colleague, uh, Dr. Zeng, who's an MD, PhD, um, as epidemiologist. And uh, he was researching low back pain, Sean. He was, he was actually doing MRIs of the back. And he noticed the, the patients because of the, the intense uh, problem and challenge that low back pain plays with patients. About 80% of our country goes to an emergency room at some point for low back pain. It's, it's a severe, significant form of chronic disease. All the ones that were most symptomatic and most problematic had this anterior aspect, this collection of tissue, visceral fat, and the anterior aspect to, of that spine in their abdomen. So he just correlated that and he decided to shift his entire focus off of back pain and uh, uh, studying the spine to just visceral fat because he noticed that it also correlated with so many other forms of, uh, of chronic disease. So he he um, he and I met and he introduced me to that biomarker and he told me, if you're interested in health, you better check out visceral fat. Come in. And uh, he he owned an MRI scanner. He was that serious. He bought an MRI scanner. <laughs> I mean, you talk about a serious researcher. And uh, so he scanned me. And uh, from that point on, I just dot connected how incredibly important visceral fat was. And uh, I've been I joined his research practice looking at um we finally finalized about almost 6,000 patients. We scanned their abdomens looking at visceral fat. So I have about eight years, uh, close to eight years now, just scanning patients, looking at visceral fat, correlating it to chronic disease in the life. And I'll just say, I don't know of a single biomarker uh, that's more effective to uh, reverse chronic disease and improve the health of patients than focusing in on visceral fat and getting getting rid of it. So unless you, Sean, I'd love to ask you, I always like to, like to ask other doctors, what do you think is more, what do you think is the most important thing? If you could follow just one thing, what what do you think would be the most important thing to uh to help people get healthier? I, I think it's visceral fat. Honestly, there's you know, let me ask you before we get into that, because why do we even have visceral fat? I mean, it's there. I mean, we it's, you can't have zero, right? I mean, we don't the goal is not zero, correct? I th- I assume no. no. So um, I, I'd like to say the goal would be to reduce it because it doesn't really provide any uh, beneficial effect. There's no uh, there's no strong selling points to it. There, you know, some people I see online that it provides some sort of uh, uh, a benefit to uh, to trauma. Uh, so, but pad- so basically, I, padding, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think that that's really the case. Um, and and with that. You know, if that was the case, then nature would put in a substance that didn't secrete, you know, all these inflammatory um, toxifying substances that, that cause uh, inflammation and disease throughout the body as, as a result. So there's, there's a linear relationship. It's two factors, the amount of visceral fat you have and the length of time. So a lot of studies just look at the quantity 
but it's quantity over length of time. So uh, th- those that's a really important aspect. So a lot of people may suddenly acquire a lot of visceral fat, and not have any problems, but the longer they maintain that, then the problems kick in. And a lot of people may have a very small amount of visceral fat, but over a long period of time, and they have disease. So it's really quantity and uh, time that uh, dictates how much disease and how much problem you're going to get from your visceral fat. Yeah. And I mean, I assume you've never seen anybody with zero visceral fat. I mean, that would, I mean, because, you know, you can't, even the leanest bodybuilder, I mean, they, they still retain 3%, 4% body fat by whatever method you want to use. Otherwise they're dead, basically, even if it's subcutaneous. And so um, how, I mean, how do we quantify? I mean, MRI, obviously, I, most of us can't sit in an MRI scanner. I know you've looked at a number of associative things. You've looked at some facial facial anatomy, some, you know, I know there's a coral study where you lay down and you look at, you know, your abdominal protrusion, basically. How do we, how does the average person with, uh, uh, absent an MRI scanner quantify visceral fat? Yeah. So what's interesting is I've learned, you know, over, over a period of time to uh, infer pretty reliably infer how much visceral fat somebody has. So first of all, Sean, you're doing pretty good. I mean, really good. I mean, the the carnivore community uh, ought to just applaud you from a visceral fat level. So if you ever had a skin, I can tell by your face, you have uh, the shape of your face and your facial creases, these nasal labial folds that get in your face are really diminished, they've diminished over a period of time as a result of you going zero carb and, and, and uh, your diet. So um, you can tell by the face and you can t- tell by the shape of the atom. And I'll turn my, 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 my torso here. And uh, you can, this distance here, the sagittal abdominal diameter, you can look at uh, guys our age and women in, in their 50s and they start to protrude their atom, no matter what they do in their 50s and especially 60s, it, it's in there. You can't suck that that back in. And that is, uh, in my opinion, the influence of visceral fat causing sarcopenia and relaxation of your abdominal musculature and your abdominal uh, fascia and tissues that simply hold in your gut. So the more it sticks out, it's not just the quantity of visceral fat, but the influence of visceral fat. So I have MRIs of people that I've managed to get rid of visceral fat and their bellies still stick out, but it's because of that visceral fat that they previously had. And as they continue to stay zero carb, continue carnivore, um, those tissues recover and then they get a nice, you know, flat abdomen. You know, my, my abdomen is pretty flat, you know, my, my plane, um, sagittal abdominal diameter. So that that's one way to tell is is what that sagittal abdominal diameter is that that the diameter of your abdomen when you're standing up is uh, is is helpful to infer that. So you when you're 18, 20 years old, everything just stayed in there. You, your tissues work so well it could hold your guts in, and then uh, after a period of time, the influence of that visceral fat starts to take it away. So I think we've lost in our species the ability to look at people. You know, we just we don't pay attention to to appearance today. It's like politically not popular and incorrect, really, uh, to look at people's bodies and start forming um, evaluations and judgments and, and assumptions about how they live their lives. But let me tell you, four million years, that's what we did, because if you were the alpha leader of the, uh, the uh, clan and we we're going to go out hunt, you would take people based on how they looked and how they performed. Uh, and n- nothing else. That's what it comes down to, your your quality of life, how you look and how you perform. And so we've lost the capacity to look at people and, and their appearance to evaluate how healthy they were and to, to help them out. You know, you could see that somebody was starting to fall behind or getting disease or something, some condition. We'd be able to pick it up. Uh, but today we've lost that capability. Now we rely on blood work and we have to do MRIs and CTs and things like that. But for 4 million years, we didn't do that. And we always got better. Today, we have science and all this blood work and we're, we're getting worse. <laughs> we're falling apart. So it's it's not technology. Um, it's really lifestyle choices and just our senses to be able to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, I, I pointed this out. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the, the degree of chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, whatever, it's, it's obviously increased, even though our technology, our ability to assess and measure and take 60,000 lab tests where our grandparents didn't have that and they didn't have, you know, some of these same issues. Now there's 
maybe they had more infectious disease, perhaps, you know, if we go back 100 years or 150 years. Um, one of the things, you know, because everybody, I mean, you don't have the subtlety anymore. People are ginormous. I mean, it's like, well, how do you look at the facial fold, fold on somebody who's 320 pounds? It doesn't really matter at that point. So this, I think the, the nuance and the subtle changes that you may be looking at, you, it's hard to see. You keep mentioning zero carb. And, you know, I know you've, you've, you know, you've been concerned with a lot of people that are just consuming masses amounts of fruit and other things. Are you seeing evidence, MRI evidence that that increases visceral fat again? Or, I mean, have you had enough chance to, to examine those people that have done that and then they've kind of changed back? How's that affecting people? Yeah, not enough that, you know, I can draw um, reliable conclusions other than the anecdotally uh, in, in the cases of uh, my patient clients that come to me, uh, they, they might be consuming fruit and, and honey and I get them to, to go off it and visceral fat will go away. Um, but I, I do also give a, a lot of other recommendations, you know, high intensity exercise and optimizing sleep. And so there, 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 there is the potential for confounding. But um, I, I do believe uh, that the addition of fruit and, and honey uh, is, uh, brings the peril of uh, increasing uh, visceral fat. I'd like to see, you know, large uh, studies where you know, a larger number of patients, we, we could follow them over a period of time. Uh, with uh, the, with honey and uh, fruit, and actually take a look at both of them separately. But uh, yeah, I follow you know I follow people online, and it looks like their abdomens are growing, their saginal abdominal diameter is increasing, and and uh, so I don't uh, I don't promote uh, fruit and honey. The only fruit that I recommend um, or could go along with eating is wild fruit uh, without uh, without a lot of fructose. And uh, twice I've tried uh, adding in honey. And uh, once I went zero carb, Sean, I, I got visible pulses throughout my body. You know, my radial, my brachial, my abdominal aortic, uh, iliacs, femorals, medial knees, dorsalis pedis, and uh, posterior tibialis. All my pulses became visible, so they would flash. So when I took honey uh, two separate times over two weeks, the pulses went away. So... Uh, I googled, and you can you can take a look at these studies. Uh, the consumption of carbohydrates inhibits the production of nitric oxide. So I suspect that that's probably what happened. My visible pulses, and by the way, I think for most of our four million years we had visible pulses that we we'd be able to see these visible pulses. That uh, nitric oxide um, increases when I go out in the sunshine; they get larger. When I do sprinting, they get larger. When I go into a sauna they get larger. And when I do fasting, um, I, I, I'm a practitioner of uh, extended fasting, those pulses, the magnitudes, and all four of those have been shown in studies to increase nitric oxide. So the corollary, corollary there is um, the addition of carbohydrates uh, is, has been known to inhibit the production of nitric oxide. And I know uh, there, there is there's one study that shows that honey is associated with the production of nitric oxide, but it's not a particularly convincing study from my perspective when I took a look at it. So uh, to answer your question, I would love to see more studies that take a look at what role does uh, honey and fruit play with uh, the potential uh, uh, contribution of visceral fat. Uh, but for uh, anecdotal experiences, I've seen my patients, it's strong enough for me to cut it out. And in every case, when they have, uh, they reduce their visceral fat. Interesting. And because uh, you mentioned, I mean, obviously being able to see your pulses, some of that's going to depend on overall subcutaneous fat. If you got a lot of fat tissue, you're never going to see your pulses. So this pres presumes you're lean already. And then, you know, maybe the nitric oxide with the vast vasodilation that, that, that it's associated with helps to facilitate that, I suppose. Um, you had mentioned, so one of the questions, you know, we, in, we hear a lot about, well, haven't recently, but in, in times past, brown fat, white fat, you know, it's, I think, I believe that's considered visceral fat still based on its location. How does that, the utilization of brown fat or the conversion of brown fat versus white fat, supposedly, how does that play a role or do you, do you have a role for that? Yeah. So, um, um, first of all, I think it's, it's a really, um, important topic, uh, and I'm glad that you're, you're bringing it up and I hope you delve into it more brown fat and beige fat. Uh, which is kind of a trans transition between white fat and brown fat. You get this 
transition. Um, and as it turns out, um, subcutaneous fat can, which, which is usually, um, white fat and so is, um, a visceral fat. They, it can go through a transition where, um, either it becomes more beige and it's basically through the addition of mitochondria, the, the powerhouses, uh, of our bodies that, the, that produce ATP. And so with the adaptation of a healthier lifestyle, you can drive the production of mitochondria, uh, towards, um, the bay, the beijing, <laughs> if that's such a word, making more beige, uh, m- making white fat more beige, uh, by a, um, high intensity exercising and, um, re- and dietary changes to include cutting out processed foods and cold immersion. Uh, those things all help to increase, um, the mitochondria within fat. So, uh, the, the visceral fat is clearly white. Um, your, your brown fat, most of it, most of it actually concentrates around the spine and within the thor- thoracic region. So, um, they're, they're really, when you, when you start to consume and, and burn your, your white fat, it goes off and it's more your subcutaneous fat that beige, uh, turns beige and, and not really to turn to, to true brown fat. We see brown fat. Uh, with the highest density of mitochondria really within the thoracic region and uh, uh, of your and of your back. Uh, so I think uh, th- it's really a wonderful area to to talk about these different depots. There's also pericardial fat, uh, fat around the heart. Uh, there's also pancreatic fat. Um, there's fat within the liver. And this is a really cool one that we did. I didn't talk with you about the first time it's on, but myosteatosis so fatty infiltrates within the legs within the muscular skeletal system and uh i know you had my my friend dear friend and colleague or uh physician colleague uh dr carlos morea on mm-hmm. and he was the one who actually uh acquainted me with a study um uh that um that talks about galdez i think criteria where it looks at these fatty infiltrates around the shoulder for the purposes of, of evaluating the likelihood uh, that a repair of the rotator cuff is going to be successful. So an orthopedic surgeon can look at that MRI, see these fatty infiltrates, and if there are too many of them, um, it's a contraindication to doing the surgery because right. they're just going to have a bad outcome. Uh, so these fatty infiltrates really cause inflammation and impair healing and recovery, but they correspond, very interesting, Sean, to visceral fat. So since the last time I was on your show, I routinely now scan through the femurs and I evaluate fatty infiltrates within the, the skeletal muscle because it always corresponds to, to visceral fat. And so that may be um, uh, a really powerful proxy for uh, looking at health uh, rather than uh, looking at, at fat. And associated with these fatty infiltrates, there's also sarcopenia. So you see uh, the reduction in both uh, the muscle mass and the strength of, of the skeletal muscle. So, uh, that's a really cool biomarker for you to be aware. Of. And I know you're an orthopedic surgeon, but, uh, I'm just amazed that that criteria hasn't yet been used by orthopedic surgeons in other areas, maybe with, with total knee replacements or total hip replacements or a uh, back surgery, you know, that they, they ought to be looking, looking at that criteria as well. Uh, but I certainly am as a health and, and performance optimizing physician. I am now scanning through skeletal muscle to look at these fatty infiltrates. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I can remember operating on on all kinds of people in, in just a subcutaneous fat, you know, different quality. Some would be bright yellow, some would be very, very white. And the 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 the, the texture was very different. And I, you know, I just just observed it. You didn't know what to do with it. It was like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> but you know, some people had a really slippery fat and some people it wasn't so slippery. It was just just kind of an interesting thing. But yeah, you're certainly right when you, when it comes to evaluating for a rotator cuff repair. If they've got a lot of fatty infiltration into the so, you know, super, super spinatus or scapularis, the re- likelihood of a repair being effective is, is diminished because we think the muscle is no longer functional. It's just been, it's been turned into a glob of fat. It's going to lose its contractile pro- properties. And I'm not surprised at all. It correlates with visceral fat and probably who knows, you know, uh, fatty liver and, and all these other things that are in there. So, um, you know, obviously it's a problem. I think most people, when we are, you know, one of the things I've sort of 
read, I'm sure you can confirm this, is visceral fat's one of the first things to appear and one of the first things to go when we gain weight typically. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. So that, the good news is I'm just plugging in my, uh, my, uh, my, my power cable here uh, using all the data in this video. But uh, yeah, visceral fat, the good news is that visceral fat is indeed one of the first things to go away when you start to, um, um, uh, to, to adopt a healthier lifestyle. So the two things, well, there's four things to get rid of visceral fat. And, and we see it go away uh, immediately in, in with the, this visceral fat and not the subcut subcutaneous fat that follows, uh, takes longer and, and it, it's not as uh, receptive to these interventions. But the four things I look at uh, are carbohydrates, diet, particularly processed foods, alcohol consumption, a lack of sleep, and then stress. Now, stress is a really interesting one. I recently put a, a post on a, a guy that had an MI, two MIs within a week, and uh, he he changed his job. He, he thought his job was causing that heart attack. <laughs> and, you know, we hear about that, but oh my God, Sean, this guy sent me his, his facial photograph and his abdomen. Uh, it's three months difference. And I, I did a, a posting on it on my Instagram chart, but it just a huge difference. And the only intervention, the only change was he quit his job and started working outdoors on leather, leather work. He's a leather worker from the United Kingdom and he makes belts outside in the sunshine. And, and he looks so much better. And then I'm going to be doing a posting on my identical twin brother. He, he just left his job. He was doing sales. And now he looks so much better. He didn't change his diet at all. As he did was reduce the stress. So I'm going to be doing a lot more advocacy about not only diet, but stress. You know, we just tolerate way too much stress. So stress is a big, a big source of uh, persistent visceral fat and uh, con contribution of visceral fat through cortisol, which tells your bo our bodies to store um, adipose tissue to, to especially um, visceral fat. So um, you really want to be limiting the amount of cortisol uh, you have by limiting the amount of stress. We just we don't do a good job with stress stress mitigation and stress management. So you want high intensity set of stress like lifting weights and sprinting and a sauna and a cold shower. That's great stress. That just stresses you briefly. It's a, a, a stress hermetic, a resilient building practice. But you do not want sustained uh, stress from like work or vocation where you're constantly uh, being stressed. I, I use the example. It's like an antelope that's in a, in a safari and the lions and tigers are just roaming around that, that poor uh, antelope all the time. That's just is going to jack up that, that cortisol. But if the, the lions attack and chase it, then it's a high intensity of stress, stress remedic. It's brief and over with, and it helps to reduce that cortisol. So we got to get rid of the lions and tigers milling around. We just want to get chased by them uh, for a brief period of time. And, and that that's what we I advocate with my clients. We want stress remedic activity, uh, but not sustained uh, stress. Yeah, I'm just, you know, Obviously, we know insulin is our hormone of storage and, you know, we need insulin. Insulin, we can't have zero insulin. You know, it helps us with obviously storing glucose, storing, building protein, storing fat to some degree and cortisol and glucagon and, you know, norepinephrine. These are the counter-regulatory. So how does, I wonder how cortisol physiologically acts because normally it's a counter-regulatory. It opposes, you know, insulin's role. Is it just a chronic stimulation changes a bunch of different things to allow us to store fat easier in the visceral area, perhaps? Yeah, well, it's it's really a bad one. I mean, it's it's uh, catabolic for muscle tissue, mm -hmm. so it actually uh, diminishes your 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 muscle tissue, um, and it's anabolic, you know, for you know building uh, it, 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 it causing fat accumulation. So it's it's doing the exact opposite of what what you want now. For a short period of time, it it, uh, it it helps us, you know. But we uh, we we tolerate too much stress for too long period of time, you know. For mil for four million years, if there were too many lions and tigers around, we just pick up our our uh, TP tent pegs and change to another location. We get out of dodge. Uh, today, we we tolerate that uh, too long. So um, I think these these hormones are very interesting to understand how they work. 
and what precipitates them. But, uh, I, you know, the, the more I get, you know, gray hair, the longer I practice medicine, uh, particularly health and performance optimization, uh, the less labs I do. I mean, I just, I think it's going to come down um, and I probably one day I, I won't do even MRIs. I'll just teach people and I'm already doing that with my high end uh, clients, teaching them how to read their bodies, certain factors, cutaneous factors on the skin uh, to give them an idea uh, about chronic disease and how it's, how it's going away if they, if they, they live appropriately. But uh, yeah, these, these uh, MRIs and, and lab tests, uh, really aren't required. I think um, it's uh, my definition of health is kind of unusual. It's I just define it: your appearance and your performance, how you look and how you perform. So, Sean, you're batting a thousand, man. You're looking good. You perform really well. Uh, you know, you're the definition of uh, health. Um, it would be interesting uh, to see your MRI scan to take a look at your visceral fat. Yeah. And for part of our community, I would really welcome other people to take a look at it because. I think we're going to, you know, favorably draw attention to that biomarker of visceral fat um, that's appropriately associated with uh, what I believe is a more optimized um, diet, which is uh, uh, eating carnivore. And, uh, and it's, it's certainly the reason why I promote it, because I, I see resolution of visceral fat and uh, resolution of chronic disease, as you're, you're, you and many of your followers are finding out. Yeah, I mean, we certainly see the resolution of chronic disease, and I, and I definitely agree with you on the fact that we probably do too many damn labs, and, and, and the, the relevance of which is questionable. You know, a lot of people, it's, it's, there's a lot of nuance there, and people tend to, you know, I, I just, there's just so many things I could go off on this stuff forever. Let me ask you a question, because, you know, you mentioned sprinting, and I, and I just did, I mean, literally this morning, I did a bunch of Windigate tests. I mean, I'm going to earn the bike doing 30-second all-out sprints four minute rest. And that's a, that's a good workout by the way. But, um, why, why sprinting over jogging or walking or something like that? Why, why do you see that as an, an advantageous, especially for visceral fat? Are you, or are you actually in fact seeing that versus somebody that's a, that's a, like a marathon runner? Yeah. You know, I, um, I wish we had studies that elucidate it better. We see a huge uh, release of uh, catecholamines, mm -hmm. uh, when we sprint, and um, myokines, so there, there are all these messaging molecules that get released, and there's so many different flavors of them. But it would appear and from studies that uh, look at high-intensity exercise that uh, these myokines send these uh, uh, messaging molecules uh, to, to di distant, part, di distant part, it's parts of the body. So they get released from the large extremity muscles, your quads, your femorals, your glutes. Then they travel to, you know, your skeletal muscle and, and other parts of your, uh, of your body. And they tell them to build muscle and to burn fat. So um, it looks like it's just a, a biological adaptation. And the way I explain it is from an evolutionary standpoint, an ad adaptive standpoint, that if you're going to run as fast as you can, that fat really doesn't serve the the homo sapien well to have large reserves of fat so sprinters you know chasing something very quickly and be able to get away from something very quickly are favored by a lean optimized muscle to fat ratio so optimal amount of muscle minimal amount of fat allows you to run faster you don't see heavy sets heavy set sprinters but distance runners um, just don't burn the fat as much. When, when, when I bring people in that are distance runners, they usually have a larger amount of both subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. And um, then over a period of time, as they continue, uh, particularly as they get older and do a lot of distance running, uh, sarcopenia comes in as there's this transition point. They start losing muscle mass and they start losing fat and they just get a kind of an emaciated appearance. But those that do high intensity weightlifting and sprinting, Sean, preserve that muscle mass and preserve the functionality of that muscle mass and maintain that that strength. So uh, the long, the short answer to your question is we need better studies. And I don't know why uh, sprinting is not more popular as a subject of studies, but it really should be because uh, when I get my clients sprinting, it just vanquishes eliminates visceral fat within their abdomen uh, very, very quickly. And it uh, sort of along with like the carnivore diet, I just, 
I just think there's a bias out there against uh, uh, against sprinting. I see it, and against uh, uh, carnivore. Uh, and and what's what's kind of sexy is distance running and cholesterol. <laughs> it yeah. seems like you know that that's what they kind of promote. But uh, you, you get the biggest change in reduction of disease from high intensity ex- exercise, uh, particularly sprinting and, and lifting weights, and then going on a, the carnivore diet. So let's talk a little bit about maybe frequency and dosing. So, I mean, if someone were to do this and how long, and there's a question from Charlie here saying, Hey, how long does it take the visceral fat, fat to go away once you get, get, you know, adjust everything. But what, what are you talking about dosage wise? I mean, how many, how many times a week, how long, how much, you know, what, what's a typical sprinting or training workout look like for, for what you Yes. Yeah. So great. So what I typically do with clients is try to get them to start slow and work up to it. Um, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to get an injury. Because if you get injured, you can't hunt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get injured, you can't get away from a predator that's after you. So from that standpoint, you really want to avoid injuries. And when you get to be in your you know, fifth, sixth decade of life, seventh decade of life, your recovery, your capacity for recovering from injury is a lot more impaired. So start slow and build up to it. I also like to address DJD, also uh, degenerate joint disease. A lot of people have bad knees and they feel like they, they, they usually acquired it from running, you know, you know, distance running. And so they feel like they can't sprint. So I, I get them to do uh, just one sprint, you know, one start very, very slow, accelerate to maximum speed, and then uh, hold that for about anywhere from four to 10, 12 seconds uh, at maximum speed. And that that's your first first sprint. So um, usually people, even with bad knees, runner knees that have given up running, they can start a practice of slowly um, uh, acquiring the capacity for sprinting. And if you're a little bit older, a little more challenged, I start my clients sprinting up a hill because the biomechanics of it um, are, uh, are, are a little bit easier when you sprint up a hill. It, it might take a little more strength, but you go slower. And it's not as complicated of move, move, movements, therefore. And the worst <laughs> is sprinting down a hill. You d- don't ever get anybody trying to sprint down a hill. So level grounds um, and and the, or sprinting up hills and then gradually work your way up. And depending on your your level of health, obviously, if you're young and healthy, you should be able to, to sprint more uh, and more frequently and more intensely than if you're older. But I, I have... I have clients in their mid eighties, you know, 80, I have an 85 year old client and he sprints. So, uh, it doesn't sprint like, uh, most of us, but he sprints. I mean, he's brought his maximum speed and he's getting better at it. So, um, it, it's something that you should be able to do for the, for your whole life, because if you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to eat and you wouldn't be able to get away from a predator. So, um, the two things I always say that, keep homo sapiens in the gene pool for the most period of time is how well you fought and how fast you could sprint. Those two things defined how long you lived and most importantly, how well you lived. So fighting and sprinting are really key biological kind of performances that you want to be really good at. And so those those are two chief strategies I work with my clients. And obviously I can't encourage them to go out and and getting fights and stuff, but I encourage them to lift weights and to exercise uh, through resistance training in a manner that emulates the intensity of a fight. Um, it's short and very, very intense, and that that's that's how I get my clients to really biologically optimize. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you look at what does it take to be able to sprint. You know, obviously you mentioned too much body fat is going to slow you down, joint disease is going to slow you down lack of sufficient muscular strength is going to slow you down. Uh, you know, cardiovascular capacity is going to slow you down. So, if, you know, if you maximize all those things or those things are doing well, which would indicate you're generally healthy, you're going to have a better sprint performance. And I look at, and I've mentioned this before, you know, 100 meters, the world record for 100 meters for an 85-year-old man is about 15 seconds. And so I kind of say, well, hey, maybe you should be able to run 100 meters in under 15 seconds. You know, that's that's probably a fair cutoff for, for many people. Now, no, a lot of people aren't going to do that, but, but I think if you lined up a thousand people and say, which ones could run hundred meters in under 15 seconds, which ones couldn't, you know, maybe there's a differentiator between men and women, but 
you'd say the ones that fall on the good side are probably going to live longer than the ones that don't. I mean, I think it's, that's a pretty clear. Now, as physicians, we can't do that. We can't say, okay, I mean, I guess we could, <laughs> but, you know, line your patients up and say, hey, go run a 100-meter sprint, and then you write that in the chart and say, okay, you got issues. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, it's interesting how you assess people, and I think, like you mentioned, you know, you can look at someone, and, you know, when, when we went to medical school, it was like, Patient appears younger than stated age or older than sta- stated age. I mean, that was part of the, the the your initial physical exam. And now we can't, it's like, oh my God, you can't observe? This person looks unhealthy to you? It's like, it's like crazy with all the sort of stuff we've gone to. Um, you know, as far as uh, thoughts on protein, fat, I mean, there's within the carnivore community and some of the other communities, there's a some people are really pushing for ketogenic macronutrient ratios with kind of protein considered kind of a, you know, not as important where other people are really emphasizing protein. Where do you, where do you fall on that spectrum? So I, I tend to have uh, shifted, you know, back away from fat a little bit and more, much more towards protein. I think protein is where it's at. I think, you know, it, it happened to be the, the, the majority of substance uh, on an animal that we would have been consuming, that we would have been dependent upon uh, in the form of protein. So um, I just think uh, protein is should be the macro uh, nutrient of choice. Uh, it's it's what I get the best results in in terms of my clients uh, to improve their appearance and improve their performance by shifting away from what was uh, previous to carn- carnivore or keto, a keto existence. I was eating the keto diet. And I was eating a lot of fat, like a lot of people. And maybe maybe it's helpful for a transition off the carbs that I previously was eating. But now I pretty focused. I'm pretty focused on on a lot of meat. And I, I eat nose to tail. I'm not afraid of eating fat. And I eat fat on that animal. But I tend to, you know, tend to uh, eat look look for selective, um, healthiest animals as as possible. And uh, you know, I I know there's studies that that, that look at uh, grain and, and, uh, conventional kind of beef and, and stuff. But, you know, I see that, that marbling going on and, and I see that in humans too, Sean, when I, when I, I do MRIs and, you know, the fatty infiltrates in those, those extremities. So, you know, I would prefer the marbling be, you know, more omega, omega three rich, uh, fat, uh, and, uh, from a grass fed animal. I think we need to do, do a better job in looking at that studies, but, uh, if I if I have to eat an animal, I want I'm going to choose the healthiest animal, one that could run like Hades, um, that looked really good, and uh, I'm thinking that it's probably the the animals out in wild instead of the CAFA ones. Uh, but um, I still I eat conventional beef. I'm going to tell you I do. I go to Costco and I buy it. Um, I'm I'm still uh, you know I got five kids, three in college and stuff, so. Um, I, I eat a fair amount of that, that kind of beef, but, uh, yeah, to answer your question, protein is where it's at and that's, that's where I start and that's where I focus. Um, I, uh, I, I stay with healthy fat, but yeah, when it comes to carbohydrates, I just don't see the benefit. The only carbohydrates I get is from liver. When I consume, you know, liver, it's probably the only carbohydrates that, that are really going into my body. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, uh, I I stay completely away from carbohydrates and adv- advocate uh, uh, doing so as well. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about studies comparing uh, grain versus grass finish, there, there's a dearth of that as far as human outcomes are concerned. There's some work being done. University of Utah, I think, uh, Stephen Von Vliet is taking up some of that work. I think Fred Provenza and some others are, are starting to look at that. So hopefully we'll get some more data on that. Um, as far as, so you mentioned, you know, fighting and sprinting and you know, there's somebody in the, one of our uh, guests, Lark, is saying, hey, those sound kind of like traditionally more male-dominated activities, even ancestrally. What about the ladies? Do they need to be fighting and sprinting, or is there a different approach for them, or what are your thoughts? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. You know, um, ancestrally, we saw that women were hunters. And, uh, you know, if you look at species, you know, across the globe, there's just one species that kind of feminizes women and into a role where they were less strong um, and and not as fit. And that's that's Homo sapiens. And it's it's really more of a cultural role and cultural pra- practice uh, and tradition than is biological. So you would you would never mess with a, a mother um, in, in in the wild with cubs or you know uh, it, it's its offspring is going to tear you apart. 
And uh, so I think Homo sapiens that way. And I'm, and I'm not act, uh, advocating for, you know, women to be high, these high hypertrophied muscle bound uh, types, but, you know, more, the, you know, uh, you know, more that they're more functional and strong, you know, in the CrossFit community, which I did CrossFit for quite a while. Um, the women were uh, amazing. Uh, they were they were very fit and uh, uh, without being huge muscle bound, they were, they were a lot more functional. And so I am an advocate of women uh, being strong and being very fast. And I think what's good for for males is good for for females in, in that way. And it should be a reflection of their health uh, to to reflect on uh, their quality of living. And uh, so I get my female clients uh, strong and fast and give them those interventions to work on as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, certainly with the argument for functionality, um, it's pretty clear to me. I mean, men, women, doesn't matter. Being stronger, being fitter, being faster is going to provide a functional benefit. Whether it ultimately results in a longer life, I think the, the jury's still out on that. But I mean, as far as I know how I'd like to live my life and I'd rather not be asking somebody to carry my luggage up the stairs when I'm, you know, 70 years old. No, thanks on that. There's some questions about, you know, just specific to your diet, uh, eggs, dairy, do any of the things, you know, any of those things creep into the diet at all, or do you utilize those? Yeah, I do. So I, uh, I'm a big advocate of eggs. I think, I think they're amazing. Um, I look for real pastured eggs, not the ones that are, are, are bought in stores. I go to farmers and I say, do you give your chickens any feed? feed them any chicken feeds because chickens are ground foragers and they go out and eat bugs. So I get my chicken, chicken eggs from chickens that are not fed any feed. They just ground forage and out picking up, you know, picking bugs and, and, and things in the winter time, they're fed uh, beetles and mealworms and things like that. So they're, they're kind of carnivore chickens and uh, the eggs are just amazing. So eggs are part of my, um, my practice uh, for strategy to optimize people. And as far as dairy goes, um, you know, I'm cautious about dairy. I think there there's some pretty compelling um, studies out there that show that dairy can be very inflammatory. So I work hard to limit the inflammation. And I think we need to study that a little bit more uh, by always insisting that dairy consumption be 100 percent grass fed, um, always organic so that you're not getting some of the other uh, substances that come from a CAFO, confined animal feeding operation, dairy operation to be included. Uh, coming into that milk. And then also it must be plain. It must be unsweetened. It must be full fat and it must be non-homogenized. So basically you want minimal processed dairy. The only processing and the last the last requirement is minimally processed through fermentation. So I prefer and recommend to my clients only dairy uh, that uh, is is fermented. So I know I've shared with you and I saw you post on uh, a time where I drank milk uh, that wasn't fermented for two weeks and boom, I got a little more visceral fat and I got subcutaneous fat. And I was like, forget that man, I'm never doing milk again. And so uh, I, I've i abandoned uh, drinking non-fermented milk. Um, I allow nature to process that that dairy and, uh, and it so it reduces the the carbohydrates that that are in the dairy to begin with and render it into a more uh, digestible form product that's easier to digest. And I actually feel better when I, I consume a uh, fermented dairy with the meat that I eat um, and fermented vegetables. I can, I can show I can eat. I'm just going to tell you, I go, I break my fast. I do a three, I fast three days or four days a week. I mean, that's a long fast. I break it the same way every time. I go to a Brazilian Churrascaria steakhouse. I eat pounds of meat. If I do not have my fermented foods with me, I cannot eat as much in that one time. So I don't get as I don't get as much for my money. So if I bring these ferments, kvass, kimchi, a uh, little fermented sauerkraut, and it's not quite, it's just small little bits with that meat, and I chew it together, I masticate them together in my mouth with the meat, I can eat way more meat and feel way better. Um, than if I don't have that with me. So I make sure that I consume some fermented uh, cheese, fermented dairy, and fermented vegetables uh, when, when I eat meat. And I know that's it's not a real pure uh, carnivore approach, uh, but I, I do that because it's the lectins and toxins that are diminished when you ferment these vegetables 
um, they get they get uh, eliminated. In one study, ninety nine percent of them are eliminated. So uh, I think it does uh, offer the potential for uh, making plants uh, more consumable and less problematic for us in our species. And so I, I'm studying them, and anecdotally, I support them and encourage my clients to, to use them. Yeah, I mean the the. The comment about the fermented dairy I've seen, I've spoke to people like Bill Schindler, who anthropology yeah. guy, who's talked about. I know. know they, yeah. Yeah. So when they talk about dairy, he said, you know, by fermenting it, it, it does increase the digestibility, makes it easier for people to tolerate, which there's probably a, some some decent validity to that. There's a question about, you know, you, you mentioned fasting. I mean, are you doing 24 hour fast? Are you doing something longer, three days a week? And then the, and then the following question was that. Is are you coupling workout to a fasted state? Do you think doing high intensity interval training has any benefit? I know the studies out there saying to say it doesn't really matter calorically, but are there any additional benefits to doing it in a fasted state, or do you bother with that? Heck, yeah. So yeah, it's a really popular topic. I love that question. So first of all, I do um, extended fasting, uh, and it's it is it is straight zero carb. The only um, zero calorie, uh, zero carbs, of course. The only only little bit of calories that come in are for like black coffee. Sometimes I fast with only water, uh, but usually I fast a little bit of black coffee. Um, but otherwise, I'm not consuming anything for 72 hours. A minimum fast 72 hours, and up to 90 up to 96 hours, and that is when I get my most intense workouts. Yeah, I'm in a fasted state, so it's a little more challenging. But that's when we'd go out and hunt. We didn't go out and hunt when we had full bellies. We would go out and hunt when we had did, digested that food. So my my highest intensity exercise is always reserved towards the end of my fast, and that's where um, I, I'm I'm always uh, sprinting and doing squatting and uh, doing the most intense workouts in a fasted state. And I think I've got great greens. You know, I'm 59 years old, and I. I have never been in better shape ever in my life than the way I am right now. So I think it is uh, attributable to uh, fasting and the carnivore zero carb diet, and uh, and then exercise and sprinting and 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 doing high intensity exercise. And I do other things: sauna, cold showers, and sunshine, and and I optimize my microbiome. So there's there's quite a bit of other things going on. But uh, to answer your users questions it's uh yeah i do extended fasting and that's when i exercise you said you fast three times a week at 72 hours three times a week that seems, seems like no just not... once a week oh, okay for okay three... got it yeah, just... but yeah three days a week um for a minimum of either 72 up to 96 hours a week and uh i don't know i just keep keep increasing I, i'll just tell you somebody else might beat, beat me to it but I'm going to look at doing a five day fast and a two day feed. Now, buddy, if I do that, when, when I come off my four day fast, I'm all about meat. I get up in the morning and that's all I'm doing. I'm recovering. I'm hitting that bison, right? I I got that carcass and, uh, that I hunted, you know, the night before I'm, I'm hitting that as soon as I wake up, I'm eating meat all day long and I feel fantastic. So um, I'm eating and I'm not working out for two days. I don't work out. I just eat and it's fantastic. So I I think I might try doing a five day fast uh, and two day feed where, you know, I'm just eating, eating, eating and uh, maybe, maybe not even working, (laughs) but uh, I don't, I don't exercise those first two days when I cover or recover from my, my extended fast. Yeah. Kind of like a lion sitting in the Serengeti when they, when they've eaten, they're just laying around and it's kind yeah. of funny if you've ever, I've, I've had the opportunity to go there and, you know, you see a lion, it's got blood on its face. It's eaten recently. The zebra, no, I mean, they're just walking right by it. They don't care because they know that one's not going to get them. You know, they can tell, they can, they recognize this guy's full. I'm in no danger, but three, four days from now, yeah, you better look out. So it's interesting. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to ask about? As far as, oh, uh, do you pay any mind to sort of circadian biology does that time of day does that does that affect you in any way or do you think about that yeah yeah you like read my mind because i was hoping i'd be able to talk about this so here's a really cool thing that i've only picked up for for the past maybe uh one month 
But uh, there's, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Alex, uh, um, Andrew Huber, Hubner uh, from Huberman Labs. Um, yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he was on Joe Rogan and, yeah. and he had a, a posting on these uh, four supplements, uh, three supplements, alphanine, ma- magnesium, and um, and then uh, apigenin uh, to, to improve the quality of sleep. So, uh, and they really did um, uh, improve the quality of sleep, but nothing, nothing touches this one intervention that I found to improve uh, the quality of my sleep and in my clients too that, that now do this. And it's uh, getting a sunrise and a sunset in. I'm just going to tell you, tell you, Dr. Baker, you need to do this. You need to fit this into your practice where so you go for 20, 30 minutes and you watch that sunset and it's going to release melatonin, the really good endogenous right from your pineal gland. And I, I don't even turn over at nighttime. I sleep so soundly now. I don't even turn over. Uh, there's no, I, I don't get up to go to the bathroom. Even if I drink in a lot of fluid, um, I just sleep so deep and restfully from um, the, the influence of sunrises and sunsets. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I follow. Um, I think it's super important, circadian rhythms. I think we've got a corrupted artificial existence with this artificial light. Uh, synthetic light in our lives. So I think, uh, I think we really need to, at a minimum, go back and experience and in- integrate within your life, uh, sunrises and sunsets. Cause, uh, I think uh, it's a game changer, absolute game changer. Yeah. I was, I was recently, we were out of town in, in Laguna Beach, California. And every morning we made an effort to what well, we did We walk on the beach in the morning, sunrise and watch the sunset. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's really neat to do. You're in Minnesota. I think you're in Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken, right, Sean? So right now you've got extremely long days. I mean, you're probably sunsets after 9 p.m. And so how do you, how, I mean, you, you just, I guess you have to adapt to the seasons, correct? I mean, wintertime, yeah. it may be sunset yeah. at 430, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's it's a real challenge. And, and this winter, you know, trying to, uh, I'm going to try to incorporate you know, getting up, you know, try to get the sunrise. It'll be, I'll already be at work probably because it will be dark. And so I'll have to like leave my building to go out and get the sunrise and, and the sunset. But yeah, you just, you just kind of have to adopt to it. The other interesting thing, you know, for the sake of your, your, your viewers and your audience, your community is um, getting those sunrise and sunsets allow for these infrared rays. So improve your mood. It's not just for sleep. But those infrared rays go into your body and they optimize your hormones. So it's really helpful for anxiety and depression. And also it protects your skin, especially in the summertime, against the damaging UVB rays um, that are also beneficial to help you form vitamin D. But the UV, the burning that you can experience between 10, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. is greatly, greatly mitigated by exposing your skin first to infrared rays around sunrise and sunset. So when I deployed to the Middle East for the military, thank you for your service. I'm still active um, Army National Guard. When I deployed uh, recently, I would get up and do the sunrise at that's the um, uh, the desert out there. I forget that was it the Sahara Desert. What the heck is that desert? The Arabian Desert. <laughs> Forgetting that it was big desert air all over. I was always in it. And uh, so every morning I'd get out there for about 45 minutes and let it hit my son. And then when we uh, when we demoed, came back, I was the only officer who went out and did this. But I washed trucks, Sean, to help us get out of there. I wanted, we couldn't go back until all those trucks were washed. I think we had like 2,000 trucks to wash. So I'm out there with my shorts washing these trucks. Everybody else is putting sunscreen on. I never used sunscreen, 10 hours in that desert, uh, no sunscreen, and I didn't even get a little bit burned. Everybody else was burned with the sunscreen on. And I believe is from the protective benefits of that infrared uh, infrared lighting from sunshine um, in the morning and at nighttime. So mm-hmm. highly encourage your, your audience to uh, adopt a practice of uh, exposing their full body. When I mean full body, I mean everywhere. You know, that, that also, if you get in on your genitalia, it increases... Uh, helps increase testosterone significantly and uh, growth hormones. So uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, don't get yourself arrested, but find a secluded area that you can do that. There. Um, so uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of recent news about sunscreens being recalled due to, to potential carcinogen issues. And, 
you know, there's, if you look at the dermatologists, they recommend SPF 50,000 and indoor, even they're talking about sunscreen on indoor, which just sounds absolutely crazy because you might be near a window or something like that. It's kind of interesting. Um, there was a question about, uh, you know, let's say you, you just, for whatever reason, you can't get out in the sun and there's these red light devices, these different lights that are out there. Are any of those things worth looking at if, if, if say you can't, say it's 20 below zero and you're living in frigging, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, and it's like, man, I just don't want to be walking around in the snow with my shirt off. I mean, what do you do in that situation? Or are those things worthwhile? Yeah. So my comment about that is I like to think of uh, the infrared lights that that's used in technology is sort of like um, the uh, uh, impossible burger, right? If you don't have access to meat, then maybe eat an impossible burger, a plant-based burger. But man, you you just got to make it happen. I'm just going to go find that meat because I ain't going to eat that impossible burger. But if I'm stuck in jail somewhere and that's the only thing I'm going to feed my my butt, then I'll eat that daggone impossible burger, plant-based meat. So my answer is, by all means, just work harder to get real sunshine because those those infrared lamps are just not going to be as beneficial. The other thing, I don't think nobody else talks about this. So I'll just say I haven't seen any studies about it other than we do know that those infrared rays that come from those eye lights penetrate our skin way deeper than the infrared infrared rays that come from the sun. We're biologically adapted for the sun, but we're not biologically adapted for these deep penetrating rays. So here's my concern. Does that form of energy, which we don't have any biological adaptation for, penetrate regions where we no longer have defenses to that infrared rays and that ionizing deep energy energy is penetrating, causing potential methylation errors and, and contributing maybe to carcinogenesis down, down, down the road. There's not a lick of evidence that I can find in, that, that support that or that say that other than we know that infrared rays from these lamps do penetrate deeper. It's just, it's just purely speculative, but I've never seen it studied. So I tell people don't use an infrared sauna use a real dry finish sauna. Don't use infrared lights, go out and get the real beneficial light from the sun because it's just not gonna be as good. There, there's greater potential for side effects and uh, the benefits are not gonna be as good as the real thing. Yeah, I think I think the lesson here, the real thing is always probably the the best thing we can do if possible. I know there was a concern about say, if you work a shift work and you're, you know, you, you, you have to sleep during the day or whatever, I mean, it's, or, or, that type of thing, but it's still still a challenge. Um, Sean, we are uh, getting low on time right now, so let me just give this opportunity for you to. If there's anything else you need to want a topic that you want to share, and then please provide contact information, social media information, all you know, you know the drill, all that stuff, so people know how to get a hold of you. Yeah. So um, what what I'm really interested in is I'm I'm a researcher and I set up a 501c3, so I'm a nonprofit, and so I like to work with alphas. I'd love to who love to have a personality like Dr. Baker. So I work with people that will are really serious about becoming the best biological versions of cells uh, because they're really interesting to study. And if I tell them to give up something or, you know, tell them, you know, I, I give them a harder thing to do, they're just going to do it because they're really interested in optimizing. They're the best people to kind of study. So if anybody in community or, or in your community in Rivero, um, have that kind of a mindset that they want to be the best biological version of the cells. Um, they could they could check me out on my website, Dr. Sean O'Mara, D R S E A N O M A R A dot com, and uh, I I would be really interested in uh, uh, considering working with him if I, if I think I'm a good fit for them. And uh, but yeah, I think we need more high performers to be more attracted to uh, modeling health and what a healthy lifestyle is. I absolutely believe that it's it starts with a healthy diet, and then it it, it transitions into exercise. So uh, I'll just end by thanking you, Sean, for all that you've done. You've been a really great uh, role model for the carnivore community uh, and eating uh, a healthy diet. And I'm super excited to uh, be uh, back with your community talking about uh, this particular space. I think it's just just fantastic. We're seeing great things in the future. I think coming from this. Yeah, and, I th and thank you for championing the uh, the the whole the whole lifestyle that I think is so important. And it's interesting to see the visceral fat. And I think you know, I think you're right that that is a very good marker. I think there's, like I said, performance and appearance are probably a lot worth a lot more than we think they are. Or, or 
uh, that's been my sort of experience with uh, trying to figure out how people are healthy or not and trying to interpret when they say, hey, this lab is a little different than that one. And I'm like, this doesn't really matter. <laughs> I don't know. 